Good morning. Please turn with me to the book of Revelation. This is a wild book, and we are reading through the New Testament together this year, and this may not be the last chronological book of the Bible, but it is the last in order, and I think for very good reason in terms of our, our present arrangement of the Bible. It's at the end, and the curse of Genesis is overturned, and there are so many things that you see go awry in the first 11 chapters of Genesis that are restored in uh, the end of the book of Revelation. But it's a wild book. A bottomless pit. Locusts with tails like scorpions. 100 million horse-mounted troops. on horses with fire-breathing lion's heads and serpent's heads on their tails, a wine press of God's wrath yielding a 200-mile river of blood six feet high, 100-pound hailstones bombarding those who curse the name of God, Not everything here is intended to be taken literally. And if you read it that way, you're not reading it the right way. There are images, there are symbols, there is figurative language. This is a picture book. And in the medieval ages, there were many versions of the apocalypse that had hand-drawn images from chapter to chapter, page after page after page. And I think those in the medieval period at least understood that this was a series of pictures and needs to be viewed that way. I say that apocalyptic language breaks all the rules of time and space. And we have here a curious mixture of heavenly realities and earthly symbols side by side, and it's hard to extricate the two sometimes. But in spite of all of the symbols, there are some unmistakable realities here also. And I'd like to spend a few minutes exploring seven of them, seven being the perfect number of Revelation. So I have seven unmistakable real things in the book of Revelation. Number one, a real Jesus. John hears at the beginning of this revelation of Jesus Christ. A loud voice like the sound of a trumpet. He turns and he looks in chapter 1. And he sees the sovereign Lord, King and Head of the church with feet like burnished bronze, hair as white as wool and snow, eyes like flaming fire, a golden sash around his chest, holding seven stars in his right hand, walking among seven lampstands with a two-edged sword coming out of his mouth. And that powerful voice. And in the midst of that terror-ridden, awesome scene, one of the things that the Lord says right in the middle of it. Middle of verse 17, as he lays his right hand on John, who has fallen down like a dead man in terror. He touches the disciple whom he'd loved. And he says, fear not. I am the first and the last and the living one. I died, and behold, I am alive forevermore. And I have the keys of death and Hades. It's all going to be okay. Because the Lord Jesus is in control. As he 
enters the door that opens up into heaven in chapter 4 and sees this awesome, majestic scene with emerald rainbow, four mysterious living creatures, cherubim, and a bright carnelian God seated on the throne, and everyone shouting, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God who was and is and is to come. Heaven reverberating like thunder. And in his right hand, he holds a book, a scroll, written on both the inside and outside, sealed with seven seals. And it evidently contains the unfolding plan of God. And no one in all creation is able to take the scroll, to break the seals, and to open its mysterious contents. And John breaks out into tears until the announcement is made that the lion of the tribe of Judah has come to the rescue. And when he does, he does not appear as a lion, but as a lamb, slain to ransom people from all nations, languages, cultures, conceivable backgrounds, people of every continent on earth. And he takes that scroll, and it's as if all of creation breaks out into joy. That in this sin-cursed world, we finally have a hero and one who is worthy to read the contents and to break the seals. In chapter 12, he is born into this world of woe, a sin-cursed world. And instead of being wrapped in swaddling cloths and placed in a manger in humble Bethlehem, with shepherds outside at night, seeing a host of the heavenly angels crying out glory to God in the highest and peace among men. Instead of all of that, we see a woman, not a humble virgin from Nazareth, but a woman clothed in the sun with a moon at her feet and a crown of 12 stars on her head. And she is pregnant and and giving birth to a child who will soon be transported back up into heaven after a short time on earth to rule the nations with a rod of iron but you also see a great red dragon, as Owen read a few moments ago, with seven heads and ten horns and and ten diadems, and a tail that sweeps away a third of the stars of heaven. And he gives chase to the woman, and eventually to the rest of her offspring, since this man-child, special as he is, is transported back to the throne of God to assume his place as the ruler of this universe. And this dragon is angry. So you have a war breaking out in heaven. And the battle theater moves from heaven to the earth. So it's into a a world of woe that this man-child is is born, a world of conflict. You have the question posed in chapter 13 and verse 4. 
as this dragon solicits the help of a mysterious beast that comes up out of the sea that represents the great world empire of the day. Who is like the beast? Who can make war with him? Invincible, right? Wrong. In chapter 14, the beast with ten kings wages war against the lamb. And in chapter 19, that sea beast and the earth beast, the false prophet, are both cast into a lake of fire. And shortly thereafter, in chapter 20, even the devil himself is bound and cast into that abyss, the bottomless pit, by an angel that has the keys to that pit for a thousand years. And the only thing left victorious in this, when the dust clears in chapter 19, is a rider on a white horse, riding triumphantly and victoriously. His name is faithful and true. He is the Word of God. He is the King of kings and Lord of lords. And he has led his armies to victory. And everyone is saying, Hallelujah! Because the victory has been won. No crown without a cross, but it has been won. And then after one last hurrah, as a thousand years in, and one last titanic struggle between the forces of evil, forces of this world, as if the devil makes one final attempt to bring everything down and to bring this crashing to the ground, and once again, a resounding victory. And a judgment scene opens up before our eyes, a great white throne. And the judge is sitting on the throne. The books are opened, and another book is opened, which is the book of life. And if anyone's name is not found written in the book, he's cast into the lake of fire along with the, the dragon. Satan. And then in the final scene of the book of Revelation, Jesus himself says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end, the root of David, the bright morning star. And John is left pleading, Come, Lord Jesus. I know people are thinking about the humble birth of that special child this time of year. But if you think even for a moment that he's just a baby laid in a manger wrapped in swaddling cloths, visited by wise men from the east, giving gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh, Growing up to be a humble carpenter, itinerant preacher, and ultimately dying an unfortunate death as a criminal on an instrument of cruel torture, and nothing more. Then you're conjuring up a Jesus of myth. Because what he really is, is the Savior of the world, the Messiah, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, and the Judge of all. And if you miss that part, you've missed the most important part. It's okay to be thankful for his birth into this world of woe. 365 days a year, in fact, it's okay. But let's not miss the most important part. And you have in the book of Revelation a real church, a Jesus who can, consoles the church, 
who challenges the church, who encourages the church, who builds up the church. And you find representing the church seven local churches of Asia Minor. Seven being a perfect number. Colossae's not there. Hierapolis is not there. But you have seven representative churches that are. They are the people of God in a world populated largely by other people. They are in the minority. And in chapter 20, the church will be depicted as the camp that is surrounded by the forces of evil at the end of time. Just the camp of the saints. Gog and Magog and the forces of evil gathered all all around them, surround them, threaten them for one final hurrah. What are we talking about when we talk about the church? People of God in an ungodly world, largely populated by people who are not people of God. When you read the seven letters to the churches of Asia Minor, this is what you get. Ephesus is backsliding. Smyrna is suffering. Pergamum is compromising. Thyatira is polluted. Sardis is dying. Philadelphia is little. Laodicea is lukewarm. Here you have the people of God. (laughs) Imperfect, unworthy, and even a bit disappointing. But I want you to latch on to this one truth. The stark reality is Jesus has not given up on them. He challenges them. He toughens them up for the coming conflict. He urges them to set their affairs in order. And he even says to Laodicea of all churches in chapter 3, verse 19, those whom I love, I reprove and discipline, so be zealous and repent. He still loves them. Have you ever been tempted to say, you know what? I don't really like, I I love Jesus, but I don't like the church. We've got hypocrites in in church. Jesus is aware of that. There's sin in the church. Yes, sometimes. Some of those folks compromise. Yes, it happens. There are problems in the church. Yes, there are sometimes. You've got members of, of the church who, who, who really struggle. Yes, you do. And you read about all of that in chapters 2 and 3. How does Jesus handle that? He doesn't throw up his arms and walk away. He warns them. He says, those whom I love, I reprove and discipline, so be zealous, therefore, and repent. Tough talk, tough love, but he hasn't given up on them. And if Jesus hasn't given up on the church, neither should we, I suspect. Real suffering. In spite of all the the images, the the pictures, the symbols. Have you ever wanted to just live in a a utopia world where there is no suffering? To be insulated from pain, where bad things don't happen, well, think again. Suffering is real in this fallen world. And for earth dwellers in the book of Revelation, there will be seven seals, seven trumpets, seven bowls of wrath. And men will even beg the rocks and the mountains to fall on them, to hide them from the wrath of the God Almighty. And even for the faithful of God, there would be great tribulation. Unsettling events? Yes. There's a PBS television series called World on Fire. 
It depicts events coming apart at the seams during World War II. But the book of Revelation also depicts a world on fire. No one gets a free pass. There would be no victory without conflict and without casualties. But in the end, victory is sweet. Jesus tells us in John, the Gospel of John, another book that John wrote, in verse 23, in the world you will have tribulation, but take heart. I have overcome the world. Suffering in this world is real. You don't get to, to build a white picket fence and pretend that you can get comfortable in this world. At least not for very long. Because there's not only suffering, there's hostility. Suffering caused by random misfortune and natural disasters is bad enough, but, but suffering caused by the inhumanity, atrocity, and pure evil of others? That's really hard to swallow. And in Revelation, you see two witnesses for Christ who are martyred for their testimony. And not only are they killed, the world around them rejoices and looks at it as an occasion to give gifts to one another, to make merry. As if the people of God are going to be in the crosshairs in, for a while at least, a short while, be the brunt of the world's hatred. Others would be cast into prison and be tested to the limit. Be faithful to the point of death, and I will give you the crown of life, Jesus promised. Chapter 2, verse 10. Still others would not be able to buy or sell. They would be shut out from normal economic transactions. If all of these bad things were to happen to you, when you, the, the normal human tendency is to want to fit in and to go along, to get along, and, and to be well-liked by others, they must be doing something wrong, right? No, it, it was contrary. They were doing something right. If you stand up with conviction for what is right, sooner or later you are going to have a target on your back. That's one of the lessons of the Bible. Yea, and all who will live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution, 2 Timothy 3 and verse 12. And in Revelation, the enemy would unleash an avalanche of venom, hatred, and intense suffering. That's very real. Real deception. Satan is called the deceiver of the whole world. You process that for a few minutes. People are being played, manipulated with propaganda, psychological games, Satan's messaging. There really is such a thing as mass formation psychosis, and people really are deluded. The earth beast or false prophet performs great signs to deceive those who dwell on the earth and to inaugurate compulsory image worship, and everybody, it seems, goes along with it except for a persecuted minority of the people of God who say no. And they pay a dear price. But it's as if the whole world is under a spell, except those who see through the lies. It's analogous to what Paul says in 2 Thessalonians 2. You can believe a lie or you can love the truth. Take your pick. But this deception is real. And there's going to be a real judgment, terrifying judgment of that great white throne and everybody bowing the knee, the books open and the book of life open. In anyone's name who is not written in the book of life, cast into the lake of fire. 
in chapter 21, verse 8, but as for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, as for murderers, the sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars, their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. In spite of all the figures, images, and the pictures, God's judgments are real, and they are totally just. In chapter 16, verses 14 through um, four, 4 through 7, rather, the third angel poured out his bowl into the rivers and the springs of water. They became blood. And I heard the angel in charge of the water say, just are you, O Holy One, and who is and who was? For you brought these judgments, for they have shed the blood of saints and prophets, and you have given them blood to drink. It is what they deserve. And I heard the altar. You remember the souls underneath the altar crying out for justice in chapter 6. Now the altar is saying, Yes, Lord God, the Almighty, true and just are your judgments. And we read that those who oppose God and the forces of righteousness, their torment will be forever and ever and ever. Do we fully understand what is at stake here? Do we, do we fully plug into the idea that God really will judge the world? And that all of us are subject to that. All of us will bow the knee. And that the stakes are eternal. And finally, real glory. In chapter 22, verses 1 through 5. And the angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb. Through the middle of the street of the city, also on either side of the river, the tree of life, with its 12 kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit each month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be anything accursed. But the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it, and His servants will worship Him. They will see His face, and His name will be on their foreheads, and night will be no more. They will need no light of lamp or sun, for the Lord God will be their light, and they will reign forever and ever. A great day is coming. There will be no more sin. There will be no more suffering. And God will wipe away every tear from our eyes, and death will be no more. Neither will there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore. The former things will pass away. We will have eternal bliss in the presence of God and of Jesus. And we will stand before the Lord Jesus in resurrected bodies in a restored creation untainted by sin. There won't be any trash, moral or literal. Imagine living in a city with a street of gold. There's absolutely no garbage or filth of any kind. No criminals. No crime watch efforts, no cemeteries, no hospitals, but everyone living forever and ever in the presence of Jesus, untainted by sin. We live in a cursed world. We, we, we can barely relate to that, where there's real joy forever and ever, and it never stops. So you have the genuine versus the counterfeit, and we have some very real things here. Real Jesus, real church, real suffering, real hostility, real deception, real judgment, real glory. We live on battleground earth in a fallen world, but not forever. This is a probationary period only for a time beyond which eternity hangs in the balance. And as Paul says, I reckon or I count that the sufferings of this present time 
are not worthy to be compared to the glory that will be revealed. Romans 8 and verse 18. So the real question as we observe these real things is are you ready to get real? Which side of this conflict are you on? Do you stand with the Lord Jesus or do you stand with the great red dragon? Have you cast your lot totally and completely with our conquering king? You'll bow the knee before him one day and you'll confess him as Lord. We all will. But I would advise doing it now rather than then. Have you given your life totally and completely to his service? Are you ready for a genuine life with no regrets before you face God? This is so much more than the story about a little baby boy his tender vulnerability being wrapped in swaddling cloths and laid in the manger. So much more. Are you ready to embrace it with all of your heart? We're playing for keeps. In spite of all the symbols and the images and the pictures, there's some very real things that loom. Are you ready? So thankful for Jesus. So thankful for him. Let's sing this song of praise and encouragement to one another. <laughs>